Hi there, Krista Cowan here with another edition of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today's question is, how do I find my ancestors before 1850? We can ask lots of variations of that question, and so today I'm just going to give you some really simple tips to help you through that process. Now, some of you may be wondering why that's even a question. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the census. Actually, we'll talk a lot about the census and what we can do there. And then we'll talk about um, some other records that you can use and some other strategies you can use to find your family, um, particularly in the United States before 1850. Now, before I dive into that, let me just do a couple of quick housekeeping things. One of the things that um, has come up on our message boards a little bit and some comments is that you can't see my screen when I do screenshots because it's too small. If you just hover right over the center of your screen, if you're on live stream, you should see a little box that says, make this full screen. Um, if you're watching this on our blog or on Facebook, that might be down in the lower right hand corner. And there should be a full screen option there just to make it a little bit bigger. We're not going to be on the site much today. Mostly it's going to be just some PowerPoint and some top talking points, um, but for future reference that should help you out. Okay, let's just jump right into this. So my first tip for finding relatives pre-1850 actually has to do with the census. So for those of you who are new to genealogy, which is quite a few of you, let me just make sure you understand why this is even a question. Um, since 1880, um, the census lists the relationship of everybody in the household to the head of household. You've probably seen that. Um, in the 1880, um, 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930 censuses, it will list the head of household and then it'll say wife, son, daughter, mother-in-law, whatever, right? Now, of course, we know um, that those records aren't always precisely accurate, so we use those as clues to the relationships of the people in the household, but they're usually pretty great clues. Now, from 1850 to 1870, so those three census years, 50, 60, and 70, all household members are listed, but there's no relationship stated. So a lot of times I see people fall into the trap of just assuming because there's children living in that household that they must be the children of the adults that are listed there. And that's not always the case. I've found grandchildren, I've found nieces and nephews, I've found cousins, I've even found some children that are not related at all. Um, either they were servants in the household or um, in one case it was the children of a neighbor and that neighbor had already moved and they were going to look for land and they left their children um, with the neighbor until they could come back to get them. Um, and the last name hadn't been changed and so here were these three children listed um, with this apparently the same last name as the head of household but it turns out they weren't related at all. So from 1850 to 1870 you have really great clues in that there's a whole whole household of people with every name and age listed, but you might need to dig a little bit deeper to dig out what those relationships are. Now, here is why we get this question about the difficulties of pre-1850 research. From 1790, when the U.S. Federal Census uh, was first taken, through 1840, only the head of household is listed with little tick marks for household members in age groups and gender brackets. So it makes it a little bit difficult. You have a name and then, you know, a listing that there's four or five or 12 people living in the household, but you have no idea um, the names of those people. So let me just share with you one of my tricks. I don't discount that census. What I do is I actually create a little spreadsheet. I do this usually um, in a spreadsheet program and I'll list the members of the family. I'll list their birth year if I know it or approximate it if I don't for sure. And then I'll list out each of the census years and how old I think they should be in any given census. Now what happens is, is I'm then able as I find possible people that could be the family I'm looking for, I'm able to just go down the column and compare the ages of the people in the household to the people on the census to see if I may have found the family. So the example we'll look at here is 1810. In 1810, Stephen and Elizabeth Bailey um, should have been about 36 and 31 years old. 
I knew of four of their children, and here are the approximate ages those children should have been in that census. So then when I find a uh, Bailey family with a head of household named Stephen in 1810, I just compare it to this list I've already made of what their approximate ages should be to see if it matches. Now, I look for all the Stephen Baileys. <laughs> I don't just find one and assume I've got the right person. Um, and I use the, in the location information that I know about where the family should be living um, so that I have more clues about whether or not I have the right, the right family. But this tool, just this simple little exercise, really helps with that pre-1850 census research. So use those censuses to track the movements of the family, um, to track the, the way that the family grows or shrinks. So for example, in this situation, by 1820, Sally was actually out of the house because she had gotten married. Um, and I knew that, and so I was able to, again, use this list to compare um, as the family had one less family member in that census than they had in the census the decade before. So that's how I use those census records. Now, um, one of the things you need to do then is think outside the census. The census is not um, the be-all, end-all of research. It's a great foundation, but there are other records that you can use to construct those family relationships. Now, most states in the United States did not keep um, civil records, births, marriages, and deaths, um, in the mid to early 1800s. But church records can provide a really valuable resource. They'll have records of christenings, they'll have records of marriages, oftentimes they'll have records of burials. Um, those were handled um, at an ecclesiastical level. And so uh, use the information that you can about what religion your family was to search for church records in those locations. Another great record um, set is probate records. We have quite a few of these online. Um, these are the, the wills, essentially, of, of people who died and how and when and where they left their property. And oftentimes, they will list the relationship to the people that they're leaving their property to. You know, to my wife Sally, I leave this, and to my, you know, three oldest sons, and then it will list their names, um, to my daughters, and, and even then you'll end up with married names of some of those girls. So probate records are fantastic for this pre-1850 research. But keep in mind uh, that what you may be looking for um, will be after 1850. So, you know, that, that example that I just used of Stephen Bailey, um, he was born in the late 1700s, but he didn't die um, until actually I think about 1862. And so when I found his probate records, that's where I got the name of those children so that I knew who I was looking for. Now. Um, land and tax records are also really great. Those tax records were taken, um, were recorded more frequently than the census, which we know is only recorded every 10 years. Um, and so tax records will help you track the movement of your family if they moved in between censuses. It also helps you start to understand a little bit as, as some of those sons come of age who is purchasing land or inheriting land um, or being granted land and then um, you know if they're paying tax on their property. Military pension files also a great record set for tracing those pre-1850 relatives. So there was the Revolutionary War here, um, we had the War of 1812, the, um, there were several conflicts before 1850 where men who were born in the um, mid to late 1700s would have fought in a, in a conflict and then been awarded a pension. And oftentimes those complete pension files, they'll list um, the name of their wife and when and where they were married. They may have had to have that certified. They'll list the names of underage children when they applied for their pension, um, possibly when and where those children were born. So again, you start to construct these families using records other than census records. And then one of uh, the little used treasures that I love is county and local histories. Now there's lots of, uh, lots and lots of these online at Ancestry.com. Um, you can find them under the category family and local histories in the card catalog. And these county and local histories, a lot of them were written um, around 1876. Um, that may seem like a familiar year to you. That was the year of the centennial of the founding of the United States. 
and there was a call put out for counties and communities to write histories of their community um, as part of a celebration of the centennial of the United States. And so they did. They wrote these really rich county and local histories, and oftentimes they would include detailed biographies of the founding families that came into that area. And sometimes those county and local histories will list two or three generations of that family. So even though it was written in 1876, it will contain information about people who were born as early as the early 1700s. So those are a really great resource, and, and I love using those. Now, um, one of my favorite topics, and we could do an hour or two just on this, <laughs> um, is this principle of coming forward in order to go backwards. Um, oftentimes we get stuck in our head about, you know, I'm looking for the parents of James Bailey. And James Bailey, you know, he was, he was married by 1850 and living with his own family, and so how do I find his parents? Well, you know, you can't, you can't just jump to the 1840 census and collect, well, you could, I guess, collect every man that's named Bailey that has a child that's about the right age um, in the household. You could end up, especially if you have a common last name, with a lot of families to filter through. So one of the things that I highly recommend is actually tracing James's life down. Um, see if you can find out when and where he died. If he had a death certificate, did it list the names of his parents? Possibly that death certificate, the informant, might have been a sibling, a brother or a sister or a brother or sister-in-law. Also, um, as you trace the family down, through even through the censuses, every once in a while you'll find an aunt or a sister or a nephew living with the family. And that gives you more information, even though you haven't found James's parents yet, about who James's brothers and sisters were. And then you can trace them down to their death and see if anyone informed on who their parents were. So think, um, think about coming forward in order to go backwards. And kind of related to that is this idea of going sideways, right? So you're not just going sideways to siblings, but pay attention when you're finding these families in the census records about who their friends are who their acquaintances are, who their neighbors are. In genealogy, we call that the fan club, friends, acquaintances, and neighbors. Um, if, my, if my family lived uh, in North Carolina, and then a census later they're living in Arkansas, I'm going to pay attention to who the families are that, they're, that are living near them in both places. Because chances are you're going to find some of those same surnames, maybe even some of the same first names, coming up over and over again. And if they're moving with them, they are probably friends or acquaintances. They're certainly neighbors, and they very possibly could be family members, sisters who have married and now have a different last name, or cousins. Um, lots of times that's how people migrated across the United States. So pay attention to what's going on sideways in that family. Okay, hey, those are just some really basic tips for finding your relatives before 1850. Um, we can dig in future weeks into some more specifics. Um, things change a little bit regionally, but, um, but that hopefully will get you started thinking a little bit um, around the census and what it can actually do for you. Um, thinking outside of the census to what other records will help you construct those family relationships. Um, thinking about coming forward uh, so that you can go back a generation and then working your way sideways to see who else is in the lives of your ancestors that might be connected to them. That's all I've got for you this week. Um, if you have a question for me in the future, please email me at ask at ancestry.com and you might be featured in our next episode. Speaking of our next episode, um, this Thursday, so two days from now, uh, Anne, um, Ancestry Ann, will be doing a presentation at 1 o'clock Eastern, uh, that's 10 a.m. Pacific, and her topic is Dressing Up Your Family Tree for the Holidays. I hope you'll join her then, and until next time, I hope you have fun climbing your family tree, no matter which direction you're going. Talk to you later.